Okay, um, hello everyone. Um, this is a presentation, um, Drupal Camp STL 2015, uh, on securing Drupal defense against the dark arts. Um, presented by me, um, I'm Andre Van Clavern. Uh, roughly uh, 20 plus years of professional IT here in St. Louis. Um, I've been building Drupal sites since around 2005-ish, on and off, not professionally. Um, professionally, probably the last couple years. Um, for Unisys, well, and our customers, mostly government, I'm, uh, I'm a senior solutions architect for Unisys Federal Systems. So, uh, you know, Unisys, big global company. Um, I work for their Federal Systems Division, which, so all of our customers are federal, state, and local government. <coughs> and I'm the St. Louis Application Security Lead for our Unisys teams. So, security. Why should we care? I'm sure everyone in this room has probably either said one of these or heard something similar to this about security. Um, you know, I only run a black site. You know, what do I have to worry about? Um, they're not going to be interested in me. I, you know, we're not doing financial transactions. You know, why do they care? Um, we're not big enough. You know, no one's going to find us. Okay, so. This is why you should care about security. These are just some really quick quotes. It didn't take me, take me long to find this kind of stuff. Um, and I actually witnessed one of them. Um, so basically the same, the same message. Okay, if you haven't already been hacked, um, you either don't know that you have been hacked or you will be hacked. Um, it, it's not really a question of if, it's when. Um, this particular quote, uh, by uh, from the Cisco 2015 annual security report is especially um, revealing about the state of security uh, on the internet right now. Um, they pulled, you know, Cisco, big company, a lot of core routing on the internet. Uh, in this report, 100%, they found that 100% of business networks having traffic have traffic going to websites that host malware. So someone on their networks, some desktop, some server, whatever is talking to websites that are hosting malware. So they're either infected part of a botnet or your users are browsing websites that are serving malware. Okay. So that, that was that was actually pretty shocking. <coughs> so the reason I say, you know, you either have been hacked or you will be hacked, um, it, they're not interested necessarily in you, right? There's many criminal motivations for cyber you know cyber criminal activity on the internet. It almost always starts with the thrill or the challenge. Um, that's what gets someone into that kind of um, hacker mentality. And I hate using the term hacker because I'm a hacker um, by definition, but I'm not a criminal. Okay. But we all start at one stage, and that's the thrill or the challenge of it. Okay. Um, uh, hacking technology. It, I, I like to compare it to like mountain climbers. Mountain climbers like to climb mountains because they're there. Right? They see it as a challenge, it's a thrill. Same with hacking. So that's where we all start. But then we all move on to um, other uh, outlets. right? Um, and these are just several more. Uh, and my point is that there are as many motivations for cyber crime as there are cyber criminals. There's always some, you know, it's, it's grayscale. There's no quantifiable number of motivations. Um, the biggest one is financial gain, um, quickly becoming cyber terrorism, cyber warfare state level hacking. Um, you, I'm sure you've all seen the news lately. No surprise. So what is security? Um, I like this quote. I use it often. Um, the only secure computer is one that is unplugged, locked in a safe, and buried 20 feet under the ground in a secret location. And I'm not even too sure about that one. That was said by Dennis Hughes by the FBI. I don't recall the year, but it wasn't that long ago. Um, and uh, I, I want to tend to agree with him. So what is security? Security is a process. It's not, it's not something that you do and you walk away from. Okay, you don't lock down a site and forget about it. Okay, a lot of people do, but that's a mistake. Security is a process. It's an ongoing process that you have to be diligent uh, with. Um, security is hard. Uh, if it wasn't, I wouldn't have a job. And we'd have a whole lot more, or a whole, whole lot less cyber crime. It involves technology and people, that's obvious. Um, 
but maybe not so obvious for some people, especially for the, the people part of that statement. Um, it's definitely technology, but it also involves people. And by people, I mean you, the people that run your site, the people that administer your servers. Security is all about, in this context, putting up barriers, as many barriers to entry as possible. Okay, uh, we call that defense in depth in the in the security world. Um, the the concept of putting up as many barriers as possible. There's not any one silver bullet that you can implement, and then you can walk away and say, "I have a secure site." Okay, um, and that's because it's all about risk management. Um, I'll tell you now, there isn't a single secure secure in the sense is that it's there's a guarantee that you will not will not get hacked. That doesn't exist. It probably won't ever exist, not in our lifetime. Um, but, it, so, but it comes down to risk management. What, you know, cutting your losses or, or, or mitigating your losses, okay? <clears throat> Back to the defense in depth concept. And by the way, this is the central message of this, of this presentation. Um, so I hope you walk away with this, with this um, a good sense of what this is and why it's important. So defense in depth, it's multiple layers of security controls or defenses. Okay. Um, it provides the redundancy in the event of a single control failure, right? It's it, if you ever gone, um, I've never done it myself, but but it's always I like comparing it to uh, a, a medieval castle. Okay, if you ever go out and visit a med medieval castle, you'll notice that they don't just have a door, right? Um, back then, they have to protect themselves against the bad guys, their enemies, right? So a castle has multiple defenses. Um, typically, they'll have you know a moat that you have to get across. And by the way, that bridge is pretty skinny for a reason, right? Um, you have multiple walls, multiple gated walls you have to move through, multiple hallways, and they often take you long routes with little slits of windows, right? Those are multiple defenses, so that when that first defense fails, and it often does, you, they've got more defenses in place. Okay, that's defense in depth in a physical world. And you must weigh the cost of that control against the benefit. Um, that's important. That's the whole risk management part of, of security. Okay, there's costs to every security defense you put in place, right? That's your budget. Technology costs money. People cost money. Okay, so you have a budget cost. You also have a system performance cost. Most security controls um, are basically putting a wall in front of your site or in front of something, right? That so there is some kind of delay there. You're going to have performance issues, perceived performance issues, real performance issues. Um, and then, often most important, user experience. So, you know, before you decide to put that CAPTCHA up on your form to prevent spam on your site, um, you need to consider your user experience, the cost of that control. How effective is that CAPTCHA uh, versus how much is it going to really tick off your end users because they have to fill out this CAPTCHA? And by the way, CAPTCHAs are not um, effective, okay? Um, the Chinese have whole buildings of people whose job are to be fed captures through through malware, and they solve them, and they get in your site anyway. So that's a good takeaway. So captures not worth the cost. So let's talk about you know with regards to defense in depth and Drupal, the layers of a Drupal system. You start obviously everyone thinks about Drupal, right? That's what we're here for. Uh, the application layer is Drupal. That's that's the app that's running. That's the first layer, or I should say the last layer, depending on how you look at it. But Drupal doesn't operate alone. It's not just Drupal. Drupal is powered by those services underneath, right? It's running on Apache or Nginx, some kind of web server, with a back-end database, MySQL typically, and then some <coughs> ancillary technologies depending on the scale and complexity of your site. You might have Memcache or Redis, that kind of thing. <clears throat> but those services have to run on something, the OS. So you have an OS layer, CentOS, Ubuntu, whatever your you know, flavor of choice. <coughs> And then, of course, the network, right? Your users have to get to you over a network, so you, your, your hosting provider uh, on the internet in general, another layer. And then users, this is back to the human concept of security. So when I say users, it's not the public I'm talking about, it's your users, your admins, your devs, your employees, people who have internal access, privileged, some kind of privileged access to your site. They are a key component to security as well. So it's not just Drupal that we have to worry about locking down. It's all these extra layers. Now, obviously, depending on the, the size of your organization, you know, you're running a blog site, obviously you're not gonna focus on a lot of these layers, but, but your cost of not doing so 
um, isn't as high either, right? Um, so those are the different layers. Uh, and we'll talk, we're going to go in this order. But obviously, users access the system in this order, from the bottom up. So your users use the network to hit the server, to hit Apache, and finally get to Drupal, okay? So since we're going to talk about the application layer first, I want to bring this up. Um, who in the room knows what OWASP is? Has ever been out to OWASP? Okay, one. Good. So OWASP is the o Open Web Application <laughs> Security Project. Um, it is a worldwide nonprofit organization focused solely on educating the world on web application security, what it means, um, how to address it. Um, and all, and, and I, I do encourage you to go out to the OWASP.org site and check them out. Read the entire thing. It's an excellent resource for web application security, applicable not just for Drupal, for any web technology. Okay, this in particular, this slide is the OWASP top 10 uh, from 2013. So one thing that OWASP provides uh, the world community is a rolling change of the top 10 security vulnerabilities that they've ranked by, and they have many, many factors, but by, um, they rank them by how often they see them in the wild and how effective they are, i.e. how much damage they're going to do to you um, if, they're ex you know, if those vulnerabilities are actually executed. So in 2013, this comes out about every three years or so, so we'll see one, we expect to see one in 2016. They'll re-rank them um, and relist them, but this is from 2013. Um, and I'm not going to go through each one of these um, because I quite frankly don't have the time, but I do encourage you, each one of these is a link to the actual description of what these are. Um, I'm sure some of you uh, understand what some of those are, but it starts with A1 injection, that's your SQL injection, your command injection, okay? That is the number one critical uh, vulnerability that, that OWASP professionals have gone out and seen in the wild, and they're the highest impact vulnerabilities, right? They're dumping your database. Everyone hear about the OPM breach? Now, I, I don't have any insider information on that one. Probably not injection. If I had to guess, it was a user, and we'll get into that later. But SQL injection typically is your highest impact. They'll get your database. They'll kill your database, um, et cetera, right? That's how they get malware into your site, which then gives them access. Um, so I just want to show you this for kind of an awareness. Please go out there, check it out. Applicable across the board, especially in Drupal. And Drupal Core, well, the combination of Drupal Core and Drupal Contrib modules have, have a, the ability to address every one of these and many more. Okay, that's the beauty about Drupal Core, especially uh, with the Drupal security team. They've done their best and they continue to do their best and it's getting even better in Drupal 8 to address every one of these which is why Drupal is so cool and secure, <laughs> at least core. <coughs> okay, so let's talk about securing Drupal. Apply updates. So many times when I've come across, um, either personally or, or professionally, a compromised Drupal site, it's because there are like six or eight major versions behind, okay? And by the way, if you're running a Drupal website that hasn't been updated since last fall, you are compromised. You might want to start talking to somebody. Um, I don't know if everyone's heard of Drupageddon. Um, it was a major SQL injection flaw that was discovered in, in uh, Drupal core last fall. Um, literally within hours of the Drupal security team announcing the vulnerability, Drupal sites were falling to this. Now, when I say falling, it's arguable that there wasn't any that we know of major breaches like loss of data, that kind of thing. Um, because the hackers were, were not, they were playing nice, I guess I could put it that way. Um, but Drupal sites were being, were, were being compromised because of Drupageddon. That was last fall. So if you haven't updated since then, I can almost guarantee you you're compromised because we were seeing infections of Drupal sites within six to eight hours of the Drupal security announcement. So please, apply your updates. Drupal <coughs> core especially, right? But of course, we've got contributed modules. I doubt anyone's running a Drupal site without at least one Drupal uh, contributed module. <coughs> Often with contributed modules, um, you have libraries, right? Um, a lot of contributed modules depend on third-party libraries. That is, a, that is an often missed update um, because the contrib modules typically have you go get those libraries separate. So when you do a Drupal update of your contrib module, it doesn't always 
include those module up or those library updates. So you need to pay attention to libraries as well because they're often JavaScript libraries. Well, JavaScript runs on the client, so you can see the problems there. So make sure you pay attention to your libraries as well. And to do so, go out to each one of those libraries and the contributed modules, home pages. Um, if they have email lists, sign up for them so that someone is aware of when those security updates come out. Okay, so, so increase your awareness of these things um, for, for any project that you're using on your site. Um, and for Drupal Core, we have the Drupal security email list. Okay, everyone in this room should be signed up for this list if you already haven't. And you can do that by going to this website, Drupal.org slash security. From that page, um, you can subscribe to their, their, uh, their security announcements list and you'll be well informed. When you get, uh, and so every Wednesday, um, there's the potential, that's when they announce all their security updates. On Wednesdays, pay attention to those tweets and those emails that you're gonna get from this team. When you get them, <laughs> review them, update your site. Number one, well, it, it's in the race for number one for compromised, uh, reasons for compromised sites. Keep your updates going. Um, version control. By the way, I don't have these in any order, but that does happen to be the number one. Uh, version control. <coughs> so you are all using Git, right? Or some kind of version control? Okay, some kind. Well, all right, I'll give you that. Some kind of version control, right? Subversion, Git, Mercurial, uh, your SCM for you know of choice. Um, I often recommend using version control on your production sites because it helps you determine what files have changed. That's kind of the built-in feature of, of, of source, control, source control management systems. But in the case of security, it's a good way of determining quickly how many, what files on your system have changed. Okay? And then gives you the ability to quickly revert back to your last known good state. <coughs> I include this uh, screenshot here of just an example uh, of this concept. Now, of course, you have to make sure that you trust your Git repo, right? Because your Git repo is on a compromised machine. So you may want to pull down a fresh copy of that Git repo before you do this because I'm telling you, attackers are extremely intelligent. They're doing this kind of stuff full time. You're probably not. They're very good at doing things like finding your Git repo and, and making modifications to hide themselves. We've seen that. But this is an example, right? I go out there, my, my website's acting kind of funky. Not sure why, so I pop out to production, pull down my, the latest copy of my repo, do a compare to my, to my Drupal project, and what do you know? HD access has been removed from my files directory. Anyone know the impact of that? So without that HD access file in your files directory, through another vulnerability in your system, the hacker could have uploaded a, a PHP file to your files directory and executed it. HT access, one of its main reasons for being in your files directory is it prevents PHP execution in your files upload directory. The files upload directory is supposed to be the only place that Drupal actually has the ability to upload a file to. So you wanna make sure that HT access file is there and secure. So I see here it's been deleted and look, what do you know, someone uploaded a file to module slash poll, uh, the polls module. That doesn't look like a poll file. Okay, so I've obviously been compromised. So a quick get reset head head, <coughs> excuse me, head hard and bam, I'm, I'm back. Now, this is not where you stop, okay? This will just get you to a, uh, your last known state, but by the time you've discovered this, most likely a good attacker has already installed backdoors. Okay, so there's other things you have to do to recover and, and I think I've got some resources later in the slide that will give you some pointers on how to recover from a hack site. Excuse me for my coughing too. I'm still recovering from DrupalCon. <clears throat> DrupalCon fever? <laughs> yeah, yeah, crazy. Got back from LA and I've been coughing ever since. Um, <coughs> securing Drupal, backups, another key here. This will save you a lot of time and frustration and it will be worth it. Automate your backups, right? Everyone pretty much does this, right? Everyone's doing backups, they're all automated. You don't have to think about it, it just happens, right? Back up your code, files, and database. That's important because those three combinations are the state of your Drupal site, right? The, the code that's running, the files on your system, and the state of your database is a snapshot of your site. So you wanna back up all three, preferably synchronized so that it's easy to restore to a known good state. <coughs> Securely store your backups. This is important. Keep them off site. It doesn't do you any good to have your backups on the machine that you're backing up. That's pretty common sense, but you would be surprised, or maybe not, of how many organizations or individuals working for organizations I've talked to 
that don't do this. They actually have their backups on the site. Obvious reasons, right? If, you're, if you have a hardware failure or, what well, you know, the hackers are smart and they wipe your backups, okay? Um, or they're even smarter and they modify your backups. We've seen that. These guys are smart. They'll go in, find your backups, modify them, so what do you know? You restore from a backup that you think is good, you're still compromised. So keep it <laughs> off site. Keep them encrypted, whether you have them on your server or not. But especially if you're moving them off your network to another third party network, keep them encrypted. But it's, and I won't go into much of this, but because of insider threats, and I'm not saying that you guys hire ha you know, bad hackers, criminals in your organization, but insiders can be an employee that has malware on the machine that has access to your backup servers, okay? Make sure that your backups are encrypted and only key personnel have the keys. Your secretary should not be able to decrypt your backups. Funny story, ask me at lunch. <coughs> backup services. Um, so if you don't have the sophistication of an automated backup system in your organization, consider services like NodeSquirrel. NodeSquirrel is a Drupal-specific backup solution with modules for Drupal that allow you to back up your site, everything, encrypt, and push it off to their network. They store it encrypted on disk. They don't have access to it. You can always restore from them. So that's a good service. Um, there's, there are several more. I just pulled this one out because it's fresh in my memory. <coughs> I don't work for NodeSquirrel. Uh, even more important than some of these others is verifying your backups. So it's one thing to back up your site, but if you don't know that you can restore your site from those backups, you're, you could have a surprise when you need to. I've made this mistake several times, actually. Um, you should, depending obviously on the size of your organization, um, I, I recommend an annual um, disaster recovery exercise, and it can be just as simple as taking a half a day declaring an emergency, standing up a VM, restoring from backups, and making sure that you can actually get a running site from your last backup. Because often you can't. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've run into this and, and colleagues of mine have run into this. Um, you think you're safe because you have backups, but you've never verified, verified them, so you don't know that your backup you know, solution is corrupting your backups or, or you're using a key that you don't actually have the password for. Hmm. Yeah, that's happened. Okay, uh, authentication. Another key thing. Drupal Core um, has decent authentication, but it can be made much stronger. <coughs> now, um, so everyone understands the difference between auth authentication and authorization, so, um, or do you? <laughs> um, authentication is identifying the user, right? Not what they can do, it's who you are. So authentication, um, securing authentication um, can be done through modules like password policy. So enforcing a strong password policy is key. Um, <laughs> this is a this is kind of related to a, a the user being your your weakest link in your security. Is often users don't like to use complex passwords. They want to, they want to use something that's easy to remember. You know, um, monkey. How many times I've seen monkey used as a password? <laughs> Um, it's actually like number one or three or something like that. If you go research it, monkey's like the top used and people actually use it. Um, so enforce a strong password policy. Um, there's a password policy module, contrib module, that allow you to go in and enforce you know, at least 12 or 20 or whatever character passwords of certain complexity. Um, how complex it is is gonna depend on your organization, how secure you want um, and how much of a pain you want it to be. But I say that telling you now that I'm gonna, I'm gonna address that as well later on. You want a very strong password policy. This is one of the number one uh, vulnerability vectors to a site. They just guess your password, okay? Or you, or you know, um, pa I have a link here to uh, this thing that says passphrases. That is to GRC's password haystacks page. Um, the guy that runs that site, excellent, um, you know, security researcher. Um, that page gives you really good insight into password complexity, what it means to be complex, and it, will, it has an interactive form that you can use to determine how, about how hard it would be for someone to actually reinforce a word based on its complexity. So that's a good resource, and it has a lot more resources too um, to that, on that topic. Strengthen your login security. So there's a, there's a <coughs> excuse me, um, there's a login security module, contrib module, that enhances the login forms for Drupal. It will limit the failed login attempts and block 
IPs. Now this is all configurable, right? You can either temporarily block an IP or permanently block an IP by, you know, let's say after five login attempts. That's something Drupal won't do. Drupal will let you sit there and, and brute force a password over and over and over again. So you really want to do something like this at the very minimum. Um, <coughs> is login security. Now this kind of, you know, with a with a strong password policy, there's a high high likely that a likelihood that you're going to have failed login attempts. But I've got a solution to that later on. So. Password policy, strong password policy, um, and enhancing login security using the login security module. Um, so by the way, you can actually have it so that if a login failure, if you trip that login failure, it'll actually notify your admins through email or through things like Nagios. So it'll send out alerts saying, hey, this guy just tried logging to his account and failed 10 times. That's a huge red flag. <coughs> um, session limits, another thing Drupal Core doesn't do, but you can add using the session limit um, module, and this is things like um, setting the number of active sessions a person uses, right? Um, this is going to depend on your, your organization and your workflow of your employees, so you're going to have to kind of figure this one out, but you know, often it's good enough to only allow a person to log in your, your website one time, have one active session going. Now that's not going to work in a lot of organizations. Sometimes you know, you're working in two different windows, you need multiple sessions, but you have to figure out what that is. What, but what this will do is, t is allow you to limit that to something reasonable, right? Two, three, I don't know, four, uh, seems a little unreasonable. Um, but you can limit the number of sessions a user can have. Um, you can also configure it so that um, when you hit a limit, it will either l not let the person that is just now trying to log in, log in, or it will let them log in and unlog or log out the other sessions, okay, and with notifications. So it's a good way of seeing, oh, I forgot to log out at home, or oh, what's this guy in Germany logged into my website for? Okay, so it's a really good visibility um, and secure control, uh, security control. <coughs> Enforcing idle session logout. So uh, I don't know if anyone's noticed, but Drupal will let you stay logged in for a very, very long time. That's not good for multiple reasons, one of which uh, recently I had to address is cross-site request forgeries, where some other site's got some code that is taking advantage of the fact that you have an active login on your website and doing something on your behalf because they're able, and I'm, I won't go into the details, but that's possible. And it's, always, it's possible because you have an active login session. Without using something like, um, um, the name of the module is escaping me, um, auto logout, the auto logout module will allow you to enforce idle session timeout. Um, and that's extremely important for things like cross-site request forgery prevention. Um, it's not unreasonable to log someone out after eight hours, a work day, right? Um, and this is idle too. So this isn't just, you know, you can only stay in for eight hours. It's you've walked away from your machine for eight hours yeah, I think it's okay to log you out. And eight hours may even be excessive for that. I know some of the organizations I do work for have a much more strict, they won't let you sit idle for more than an hour, sometimes less. So that's extremely important. Prevents a lot of issues. Also prevents someone from just, you know, you walk away from your machine and someone walks in and starts working on as you. So that'll help that. Uh, this is a, the next one is two-factor authentication, or 2FA in the industry. Um, Drupal.org, the security team just enabled two-factor authentication, and we'll go into what that is in the next slide. Um, for anyone that has, this is extremely important for anyone that has an, um, uh, uh, elevated rights on your site. So someone other than a normal like publisher, so like an admin level person that can do a little bit more damage on your site than your average user. Um, but I would argue that some organizations probably should enable this for all their users. So two-factor authentication, um, everyone, anyone here know what two-factor authentication is? Raise your hands. Oh, good, excellent. So you're not gonna learn much on this one, or maybe you will. <coughs> so two-factor authentication is a subset of what's called multi-factor authentication. Factors of authentication are, and this is what everyone is used to, something you know, so a login and password, something that you have in your mind and you can remember <coughs> and reproduce. So it's something you know, something you have. This is becoming popular. This is the typical second factor authentication component here, which is something you have. It's some kind of token, um, a card um, that you can put in your machine. Um, that is something you have, right? It's a random, it's something that changes, but it's in your possession. Something you are, like a fingerprint, 
an iris or a retina scanner. By the way, those are different things. Um, so something you are, something about your person that's unique to you. Something, and in more secure installations like Intelligence and DoD, um, or some high tech companies, uh, there's some place you are. Um, we won't go into the much of that because that's kind of a wonky uh, factor of authentication. But you know, you can only log in from a particular terminal, or there's actually GPS built in, and they can tell where you are. Um, they don't want you logging in from China, right? <clears throat> Etc. And there's a, there's some other odd ones too. So two-factor authentication is the subset of multi-factor where there's just two factors, right? It's typically something you know, so you still have a login and password type thing. <coughs> but they, what you want to have a second factor that will be highly unlikely that an attacker could get to. So passwords can be brute forced. Passwords can be read off of a sticky note on your machine. You stuck it under your keyboard, um, etc. But a second factor that is highly unlikely for someone else to have, like a two-factor token or m like my phone, right? Um, for most of my accounts, you can't get into them without possession of my phone or my keys that has a two-factor token on it, right? So um, D.O, Drupal.org, has enabled two-factor authentication using the TFA module. So TFA module is a base module that provides an API for two-factor authentication, and it checks for something you have. So this is like those token type things. <coughs> it's pluggable. It, it, it's pluggable in the fact that you can write a two-factor plugin for it. So if you have a two-factor solution like YubiKey or Yubico, if anyone's heard of those, um, RSA, that type of thing, you can, you can write a module that plugs into TFA and enables two-factor authentication for that particular solution. The TFA Basics plugin <coughs> module is a basic plugin module for TFA that provides two-factor authentication in the form of time-based one-time passwords, or TOTP. Um, which supports things like free OTP, which is this little blue icon up here, Google Authenticator, which is a real popular one, Authy, which is another one, and a few others. There's several of them coming out. It's taken off like wildfire because it's extremely effective at preventing logins. Um, it also provides SMS login codes via Twilio, so you can get your little, you know, your six number, you know, authentication code sent to your phone and you plug it in. So it supports that. <coughs> And it also has the concept of trusted device, which means you can enable all this two-factor authentication, which is kind of a pain because you got this second step you have to go through. But this, you have a cookie-based trusted device concept. So you can say, once I do this, trust this device because you know I keep high security around this laptop. So I want to trust that you know you don't have to ask for that second factor authentication every time I go in if I'm on this device or if I'm on on my phone, that kind of thing. So fun fact here. Um, this discussion on uh, groups, the security groups in D.O. The security team, when they were when they were testing this solution, actually put up a bounty. It's a five hundred dollar bounty, and they stood up a, a Drupal seven site, and basically gave out the admin login and password, and said, "We'll give you up to five hundred dollars if you can find a weakness in the system. Basically, if you can get in and modify the front page, we'll give you money." So they turned on two factor authentication. There were some bugs found, but no one was able to get into the site and modify the site. That, that's a testament to how effective two-factor two authentication can be when it's, when it's uh, used properly. So this is a highly effective solution to locking down your site and preventing access to your site through the front door, through the login process. Okay. So very important. Um, input filters. I'm going to throw this out there. Everyone familiar with the PHP filter? Know what that is? Who's using it? No one should be. Good. Only one hand. Okay, yeah. Um, if you don't have a very, very good reason, um, and I'd be surprised off that. I mean, you know, I'm sure there is good reasons for it, but if you don't have a good reason or there's no other way of implementing what you think you need to do, don't use PHP filter. PHP filter allows, um, <coughs> for those that aren't familiar with it, PHP filter allows embedded PHP code in your blocks and in your in your pages, right? So you you want to put a, a date that's always accurate. So you put a little PHP code in there to echo out the, the current date when that node's being read, that kind of thing. That can be done in the module, by the way. Um, but that's the kind of stuff that that enables. But imagine how things can go wrong if an attacker discovers that you have a field or a, a, on your site on a form that allows arbitrary PHP code to be injected, and he uses some other vulnerability in the, in the system, SQL injection, whatever, to get that code into that field, bam, he owns your site, okay? 
very, very bad. And for that reason, it was removed in Drupal 8. So Drupal 8 has no, ha, does not have the concept of PHP filter anymore for that reason. Along the same lines, be careful with full, the full HTML filter. Okay, if you need to use full HTML, make sure you only give it to people who absolutely need it. Okay, because full, H, full HTML gives you the entire HTML you know, tag set. Many of them are extremely vulnerable to attack. Um, I say that too, but you also kind of have to be, so you got filtered HTML as well, which we all must all use, and the, the defaults that come with filtered HTML um, are, are relatively safe. They're, it's very difficult to execute vulnerabilities against those particular tags, but often site maintainers or site builders will start adding tags to filter HTML. That's extremely dangerous. You might as well be running full HTML from a security perspective. So be cognizant of that. Um, there's lots of resources too. You can Google it on, on the kinds of tags that are vulnerable. I don't have time in this presentation to go into them, but be careful adding tags to filter HTML. Very careful. Okay, uh, security review. Very important. This is actually a really good one too. The security review module um, will allow you to, it, it will interrogate your site. It's got some minor configuration you have to set up. But when you run this, it will provide a report on many common vulnerabilities in Drupal sites. Um, it's actively maintained. It's very good at checking a lot of different things and, and red flagging right away. So at the very least, plug in secure review in, in, your, in your sites um, and run the report. <clears throat> and remember I said security is a process, so don't just do this one time. If you make any major changes to your site, run this report again. It should be part of your workflow. Okay, security is a process. And this is an example report. I actually have a sandbox site that I intentionally keep vulnerable, um, and this is a report from that site, just a snippet of all the other things it found. So it found things like I didn't set the base URL in settings PHP. Okay, that's important because there is a vulnerability in Drupal. Um, it's, it's actually been pretty much mitigated in Drupal 8, but in Drupal 7, if you don't set, it's, it is important to set your base URL if you can. In some situations you can't because it confuses Drupal, but if you can set it, um, it, will pre it will prevent your Drupal site from, from behaving like it's another site and bypassing some of your other security controls. Uh, errors are written to the screen, so I've got the settings set, so if you have a PHP error, your end users are going to see that. That's an information disclosure. It can give people information about your back-end site that you may not want to give them, so make sure errors are turned off, and this will show that to you. Uh, PHP files in the Drupal files directory can be executed. Remember that missing HT access file? That's what this is saying. Hey, your HT access file is gone. P PHP files can be executed. So this is a very, very good tool of reviewing your security uh, posture on your Drupal site. Use it, review it often. Review your roles and permissions. So, <coughs> principle of least privilege. Um, this is going to go over. I hope you stay. I'm going to try and speed this up. We're getting close to lunch, but bear with me. Um, principle of least privilege. Concept of only give your users the absolute access they need to do their work on the website. Yes, it's very convenient to have admin rights. Very, very dangerous to have admin rights. Or any other right outside of your daily job, right? Um, because doing so increases your, uh, your attack surface, the number of things that someone can use to, to penetrate your site. Um, so consider blocking user one in production. User one is the admin user. Um, I'm sure there, there's, there's some edge cases, but if you're using proper change management, configuration and code, and going through change management, there should be no reason admin should be even active on your production site. And by dis disabling the admin user on your production site, plugs a bunch of holes, right? No one can use your admin. And that, and that, that goes for any user that has an administer uh, permission or administer role that gives you any kind of permissions for administer. If they have an administer right, you should question it because you shouldn't be administering anything in production, okay? Um, and regularly audit the roles and permissions. So this is just not a one-time thing. Anytime you deploy a new module or any major release, take the time, sit down, print out all your roles and permissions and do a sanity check, okay? Um, you could have made a mistake or a developer could have made a mistake. Um, or a hacker has gotten in your site and given a user the admin role, okay? So regularly audit those, role, those roles and permissions. Um, contributing custom modules. Um, there's the concept of secure coding guidelines. Um, so there's, there's coding guidelines that you know, Drupal has, but there's also a set of secure coding guidelines that the security team maintains. Um, 
especially for custom module development. Well, it applies to both contributing and custom modules. Contributing modules are, 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 are expected to follow them, but these are contrib modules, right? The security team has no purview over, over third-party modules unless someone asks them to look at something. Um, but if you're going to write custom modules, um, make sure you follow the secure coding, coding guidelines. Um, I've got links on further slides on the, where those are. Um, when you're looking for custom or contributed modules, <coughs> look for well-adopted and actively maintained mod maintain modules. That's extremely important for the same reason I just mentioned. Contributed modules are not under the purview of the Drupal security team. A lot of good developers out there with good intentions of writing secure code, but security is hard. So there's often security vulnerabilities in modules. So if you want to look for modules that had been around a while, um, this is, I just grabbed some screen captures from a typical project that's mature, that's been around a while. So you want to look for things like the reported installs. This particular one's 175,000 sites are reporting in that, hey, they're using this module. That's a good sign. Over a million downloads, another good sign. If you look at the down, further down the page in the downloads, you'll see that it's actively maintained. They've actually had a release, a recent release this year, June 1st. That's a good sign. That means someone's working on this module and maintaining it. You don't want to use a module that hasn't been. Um, now, this isn't always the case. If it's, if you do have modules that are installed everywhere, but haven't had a recent release, but that could be because it's extremely secure already. Okay, but th generally, it's not a good sign if they haven't had a, a general uh, a recent release. Um, and then there's also a little stat a statistics box off to the side, which gives you a good feeling of the number of bugs against that module, how many new issues recently have been reported, what the response rate on those bugs are. So if you've got a bunch of bugs being reported and the response rate is low, it's not an actively maintained module. A bunch of people are complaining and no one's listening. So look for that kind of stuff. Um, I'm going to buzz through this other stuff because it's not Drupal specific, but these are the other layers of your stack that you need to be concerned about. So, um, but we're running short on time, so I'm just going to fly through these. Securing Apache. Of course, these slides are online, so you can always go back to this, right? Um, securing the transport layer, especially recently this has come out. A lot of SSL problems. Um, well, a lot of sites not using SSL, that's bad. Uh, there used to be really good reasons not to use SSL, especially for, especially for smaller organizations. One is cost. Those SSL certs, a, a real SSL cert is not um, free and used to be not cheap. That's changed. Um, but I wanted to let everyone know about this project called letsencrypt.org. Free TLS or free SSL. Okay, this is a consortium of organizations, including the EFF, that have come together and said, you know what, everyone should be running SSL. And they looked at the barriers to entry, and one of them was cost. So this project, which is going live this fall, so it's September 2015, Let's Encrypt is giving websites the ability <coughs> to um, run scripts, basically, to, you no, know, you'll get a basic SSL cert, so none of the advanced stuff, you still have to pay for that. But there's reasons to have those. So, but if you, all you need is basic SSL, and everyone, has a reason to have basic SSL at least. Go to lessencrypt.org, sign up, run the script. Um, they'll do some fancy stuff on the back end. It will automatically set up your SSL so you don't have to be an expert, and they'll set it up right, and you'll have free TLS. TLS. But don't just trust them. Go out to ssllabs.com, um, one of the best sites out there for testing your SSL setup. So once you're all set up, you go out there, you punch in the URL. They'll tell you what's wrong with your SSL configuration, they'll give you a grade and tell you what's wrong. You can go back and fix them. Um, one of the things that can go wrong, <coughs> excuse me, oops, um, there's this concept of HSTS, which basically all that is, is is you're telling, it's a header that can be set um, when, the, when the browser hits your website that says, hey, I'm all SSL, don't ever try and access me outside of SSL, and that will prevent some other vulnerabilities like downgrading um, vulnerabilities. Um, by the way, there's another Drupal kit, a Drupal module called Security Kit. Um, that kit or that module, once you plug it in, will with a checkbox you can enable HSTS. Um, by the way, that module though, fantastic. Go out, look at it, use it, but be careful because you can break your site. Um, but look at it because it also addresses many other OWASP concerns. That list of all those concerns at OWASP, that module is very good at addressing a lot of them. Um, file system permissions on Apache. Apache should only be able to write to, to the slash files directory and the temp directory. And that's done through file system permissions. And to do that, you just basically need to make sure that the owner of everything outside of your files and temp directory, you know, your group owner or your user ownership and your group ownership on your Linux file system, I'm sorry if you're using something else, um, basically needs to be owned by something other than whatever Apache is running as. So typically on a, on a box, it's running as Apache or dub, dub, dub. Whatever it's running as, you should not see any of those in your 
your outside of the files and temp directory because what that does is it gives potentially Apache the ability to write to those directories or modify those files. That's really bad. That's a common vector for getting malware into your site. Matter of fact, if you follow that step alone on the Apache, you would not have been compromised by Drupageddon. File system permissions saved a lot of people <coughs> with certain types of things that the hackers did with that vulnerability. It wouldn't have protected you from the actual vulnerability, but it would have mitigated the damage by not allowing them <coughs> to upload files to your system, which can do damage. Um, and by the way, also, this particular thing can be tested. That, that is one of the things it reports on in the security review module like I showed you. Um, and even more important, just like Drupal, making sure you don't have any modules. I didn't actually mention that, but make sure that you don't have any modules even on the box that you're not using. If you're not using it, remove it. Because it, by having it there, it can be turned on through a method you don't know about, and it can, do, you know, can potentially do some damage. Same with Apache. Apache comes with a ton of modules baked in. Look at what they are. Take the time. Look at them. Remove a lot of them. Most of them aren't needed for a Drupal site. And each one of them is a potential attack vector. Now, Apache is very, has a very good recent security history, but you want to reduce your, 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 your um, attack surface as much as possible. Reduce the number of things that could even potentially go wrong. So make sure you get those out. Um, monitor your logs. Security is a process. You don't just stand it up and just you know, watch it for a day or two and go away. You need to be having someone, either a person, that's expensive, or even better, an automated system that watches your logs and flags on, on events. Monitor your logs. Securing MySQL, the very first thing you should be doing when you set up MySQL, but you can do this afterwards as well if you haven't already done it, is run the MySQL secure installation script. It will do things like, <coughs> like um, uh, disabling remote root login, uh, dropping the temp database, or the test database uh, in MySQL. Um, lots of really good things. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that will that will p potentially have um, damaging effects in your MySQL box. Um, use strong, random passwords. Really long passwords. You only set them once. They're in code. Make them very long, extremely random. Change your root user. So MySQL comes by default as root as your admin user. Ch change it. Change it to something that can't be guessed. <coughs> Disable local file access, and you do this in your mycnf file by setting local in file equals zero. Um, this isn't a, this isn't a huge thing, but it does remove a potential vulnerability in MySQL. This will t prevent MySQL from having the ability to look at a local file on your machine. You can only imagine what can go wrong there. Um, if possible, bind. Uh, your MySQL process to an internal private IP. So um, that's just an architectural decision. You know, having a private non reliable network between all your services in your stack um, that makes it extremely uh, more difficult for an attacker to touch your MySQL box directly. So using you know, typical 10.192.168 or addresses instead of your public internet address. Your MySQL bo box will typically have an internet address because it needs to go out and get patches and that kind of, that kind of thing. Um, but try to bind to a private one if you can. And you're seeing a pattern here. Monitor your logs. Securing the OS, <laughs> patch regularly, just like Drupal. OSs get patched all the time. You should, you should be checking for patches weekly, if not daily. Automate it. It's easy. Um, you can close a lot of vulnerabilities quickly that way. Back it up. Same with Drupal. And test your restores. Harden it. For OS, there's nifty little scripts like Bastille Linux. This is excellent. It will go through, ask you, take you through a bunch of questions, um, and establish, um, you know, disabling accounts, setting up um, um, policies on your system. Uh, it'll also check for partition, you know, a bunch of different things. But it's a it's a script that will harden your Linux box to whatever degree you want. Um, I'm going to throw this out there. It's called uh, DISA, or Defense Information Security Agency. They're the guys that are um, the, the techie guys for our military. They, and intelligence, they publish what's called Security Technical Implementation Guys, or STIGs. Um, these guys know how to lock down boxes, and they give you the instructions to do so. Take a month, take a, well, take several days and go out and read these things. Um, give them to your admins. Have them learn it. Um, really good direction on how to lock down Linux boxes and Windows boxes. Stigs actually cover OSs, all kinds of OSs, all kinds of devices, um, and, and software as well. There's even one out there for Apache. Um, stop disabling SE Linux. One of the first things people do when they set Linux, Linux is disable SE Linux because it breaks stuff. I suggest you go out and learn how SE Linux works because it's not that hard once you get over that, that learning curve, and it will lock down your site 
even more. It will limit what Apache can do and all your other processes. So stop disabling Linux. Conversely, learn it. Um, enforcing configuration through automation, Ansible. Um, Ansible, Chef, Puppet, automated configuration management. <coughs> This will not only allow you to consistently set up your systems, but check your systems and reset them if they get changed. Um, I like Ansible myself, and talk to Jeff Gearling. He's an expert. Um, our own Jeff Gearling here. Remove all unnecessary software. So if you've got packages on that machine, because you know all these all these releases come or all these uh, OSs come with software that we just don't need for an Apache box, remove them. You're reducing your attack your your attack surface. Securing SSH. Things like. Uh, disabling root login, remote root login, okay? Disabling password authentication. You should not be logging in with a login and password to SSH anymore. Um, it's much more secure to use key-based authentication. And with, uh, with the support, even in Windows now and on the Macs, uh, with, with um, uh, secure password stores or your certificate stores, it's transparent. It's actually more convenient and it's a, a lot more secure. Um, and that, that link there is a link to other resources on how to properly secure SSH. Um, host firewall. So if you don't have a nice fancy firewall on your network out in front of you, seriously consider um, using the host firewall configure, or, uh, facilities that come with your OS. Um, not only blocking all traffic that doesn't need to be coming in, but also preventing Apache from reaching out to the internet. That's a, that's a huge attack factor. That's how got bad guys get code into your system by allowing by going out to the internet. Well, your Apache box should not be going out to the internet. Period. Okay, um, fail to ban, that's a nice little utility you can run as a process, watches your logs, and can do things like, hey, this guy's trying to you know, scan my site, let's block his IP address, that kind of stuff. That's a link to fail to ban. And I already mentioned the Ansible, De uh, Ansible Jeff Gearling is writing a book, Ansible for DevOps. Good book, excellent guy, um, loves to help you out. So if you want to learn Ansible, that, get that book and talk to Jeff. Securing a network, I'm just going to fly through this because... Most of us in here don't deal with this, but you know you got your firewalls, partitioning networks using VLANs, intrusion detection systems, prevention systems, um, web application firewalls, content distribution networks. Just a quick thing on content, content distribution networks. Um, all these are common content, uh, content distribution networks. I particularly like Cloudflare because they have a free tier. Check it out. It's totally worth it. Um, everyone knows about the typical CDN functionalities, geolocal uh, geo content distribution. This is all the performance benefits you get from the CDN that everyone thinks about when you think CDN. Analytics, IPv6 support, if you need to do that, if you have you know, requirements for that. Um, but they also have security-related services like denial of service prevention. These guys have big, fast networks all over the world, the world and they're able to divert traffic. So if, if you are a political site or you know, someone has a reason to try and bring your site down, they can help prevent that from happening by diverting bad traffic. They also have uh, web application firewall support, so actually looking at the packets going to your site, they can actually prevent SQL injection, spam, cross-site scripting, those kind of things on their network before it even gets to you. Again, Cloudflare's free, look at it. Um, they can also terminate SSL and TLS on their network for you as well. Um, they can do things like IP-based traffic blocking, so if you're a government site and you don't want traffic from China, Sorry, I'm picking on China. They're just in the news. Love China. Um, visitor reputation. Uh, things like, so these CDNs, right, they're sitting in front of millions of websites. They're seeing all the traffic. They have this intelligence. They know that this guy in South America likes to scan sites and try and penetrate sites. So guess what? They can block that guy proactively before he even attempts to get to your site. It's called visitor reputation. Um, all that said, that's a lot of complex stuff that people have to set up. So it's often um, wise to to use managed Drupal hosting uh, companies because these guys do it for a living, that's their business, and they know how to do it well. These are just some samples of ones I'm familiar with. There's, there are others, but Acquia, Pantheon, Black Mesh, and Platform SH do it, and they do it well. They're well known and established. <coughs> so, so consider using them instead of trying to build your own, because building your own is hard, um, unless you've got the resources. So securing the user. Man, I'm really going off, I'm sorry about this. Um, securing the user. Um, by the way, you are the weakest link. Um, that's a fact, and it will probably always be the case because you are fallible. Technology is fallible, but a lot less fallible than you. It will do exactly what you tell it to do, exactly what you tell it to do, right? So password management, um, you remember you just, you just set up a really nice, strong password policy on your site that everyone's complaining about because now you require you know 20 character random password that no one can remember, and they want to write it down on their keyboards and stuff like that. Password management, use LastPass or KeyPass or OnePass. A password management tool. Yes, I know LastPass just got hacked. Guess what? 
it's irrelevant. Good design, good architecture. Even though they got in, you're totally fine. Just change your master password. Um, but using something like LastPass, full integration on the laptops and all your devices, you've got all your passwords. It remembers them for you. You don't have to remember anything but your master password, um, which enables the, your end users to have these nice, secure passwords, and they don't have to complain anymore because it just does it for them. Um, and LastPass, as particularly, um, that's the one I'm most familiar with, has passed a lot of scrutiny. Um, phishing, you know, phishing is really bad for securing, uh, or for your users. Um, people like to help out. Um, they have emotions that can be attacked, and attackers know that. So getting you to click on links, getting you to donate money, you know, all those kind of things. Everyone knows what phishing is. Um, online hygiene or bad habits, you know, they, they like to spend time on questionable websites. Well, guess what? You're going to get malware on your network. They're going to get control of that server or that, that user's workstation, watch everything they do, blah, blah, blah. Um, of course, malware out of as a result of online hygiene. <coughs> so you want to change their behavior. And often it's not enough to tell them they need to change their behavior. How often does that work? You tell a developer, hey, you need to do this. And even you need to do this because of this. It doesn't work. You need to change their behavior through awareness. And that's where security awareness training comes in. Highly recommend establishing a security awareness training in your organization. It will change your, the, the human behavior through awareness. It's been proven psychologically. Um, people have emotions. When they understand the impact of what they're doing, they will change their behavior. Think topics like phishing will be covered, or you should cover in security awareness. Poor password security management. You're seeing a pattern here. Sharing too much on social media about your organization, about your vacation plans, etc. cetera. The fact that you know, your network security team just got fired or something, bad. Uh, data loss or exposure. Things, you know, like, <coughs> excuse me, taking their unencrypted laptop home with, you know, the nation's you know, data on it, yeah, bad. Uh, malware infection vectors, by the way, um, I'm gonna go real quick, but um, anyone catch that little USB device that was sitting on the floor out by the, by the elevators? Okay, probably not one of you guys because you're in here, right? Um, that is a common infection vector for malware. If I want to get in your organization, all I have to do typically is with about a 70 to 80% success rate, drop a few key fobs or USB drives outside the organization. Someone's gonna pick it up and because of curiosity, they're going to plug it into the machine. Guess what? I own their machine. In a few days, I get a little notification on my little Linux hacking council out in Russia that says, hey, here's your back door. I'm in. I own you. Um, that's how RSA fell. Um, well, I take it back. No, misspoke. That's not how RSA. RSA fell from an email. A secretary opened a PDF. Same concept, though. Um, I won't mention the company that failed for this one. Um, but a common attack vector. So that was just a concept. If you pick that up and plug it in your machine, I'm sorry. Um, it's not actually infected, but it did come from DrupalCon two years ago. So, you know, be careful. <coughs> Security awareness impact. Um, I pulled these statistics just to give you an appreciation for the effectiveness of security awareness training. Um, a, a, a recent test, first fish. So, so the, the security guys got together and sent out a phishing email. 30 to 60% typically fall to that to that, you'll get 30 to 60% of click-throughs on a phishing email in your organization. Um, after security awareness training, they saw that the, that the people that fell, was, uh, the number of people that fell was as low as 5%, and that was because of um, how often the training was executed. Again, security is a process. You don't just do it once. It has to be regular. <clears throat> they showed that if you had quarterly, quarterly security awareness training, it fell to as much as 19% failure. If you did it every month, it was 12%, and if you did it monthly, it was 5%. I've actually worked with a government agency that does uh, monthly security awareness for this reason. And that's where that, those, that, that information came from. So in summary, you will probably get hacked. You may be hacked already to some degree, or at least an attempted hack. Maybe, maybe no real impact, but you either have or will get hacked eventually. You're not special. Um, they don't care that you don't have any information. You have servers. You have resources that can be used as a botnet, that kind of thing. So um, you probably will get act. Security needs to be a first-class requirement. Don't, it's, it should never be a secondary, and I know it always is, but when you're rolling out a new site, security should be a first-class requirement. The user's office the weeks, is often the weakest link in your security. Patch and update quickly and often. Back it up and test your restores. Drupal Core is secure, generally can be made to be insecure though, right? Through contrib modules, bad configurations, et cetera. Uh, well adopted and maintained on contrib modules. 
make sure you use those. Stay away from those newbies unless you're, you know, the developer. Uh, limit custom module development as much as possible, but if you must, make sure you follow the secure coding guidelines, and that is a link to the secure coding guidelines. Um, and my final message that I hope everyone walks away with here is that defense in depth will mitigate the impact of your security incident. Say, so when you get hacked, the number of and quality of those controls that you put in place will limit the damage that's been done. <clears throat> These are a bunch of resources um, that, that will be really handy. Some of them are, I mentioned, some I haven't. Um, Securing the Human, Security Compass, they provide online uh, security awareness training and they keep it up to date. Okay, so um, it's very difficult to, um, not impossible, but it costs a lot of money and, and resources to develop your own. They do it for you, for a fee, of course, um, and they keep it up to date. So very good resources here. And Security Compass actually has a free OWASP Top 10 um, course that you can take. So those are the resources. So um, there's not, I, we're out of time. Lunch is, is like going on, we're actually missing it. I sincerely apologize, but, um, but I wanted to make sure everyone got the message, okay? So that's really important. Um, feel free to come up to me um, either at lunch or whenever uh, I'm free. You can also reach out to me um, on D.O, I'm operator. I'm also on Twitter, operator. I like the matrix, okay? That's where I came from. Um, so reach out to me with questions or, or whatever. I do appreciate feedback on this. Uh, I know this was a little long-winded. I'm sorry for the coughing, but I'm hoping, um, I'm hoping that you all learn something and, and walk away with a better appreciation for security. Thank you. So just one heads up, uh, the lunch, all the, all the box, uh, boxes of lunches are right up here to the right, and there's a lunch room right over here. You can also go up the steps a much more scenic, prettier lunch um, uh, if you want to enjoy that. So feel free to make yourself comfortable anywhere.